I'm Dr. Daryl Ray, and I took a left at the valley, and the party was really good. <laughs> I know we shouldn't have to scream that we're atheists. You know, we don't have non-astrologers and all that. But with the religious people taking over the world, I mean, we can either speak up or be pushed into a corner. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance, and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. Coming at you from finally warm Abbotsford, BC, this is Left of the Valley. My name is Kevin, and I've always wondered, why don't they make mouse-flavored cat food? Joining me as usual is a team that wonders, does a fish get cramps after eating, or do they wait an hour? She'll shove a lamp up your ass so you can lighten up, Nancy. I do what? <laughs> Wait. I'm, not, I'm not fully awake, but okay, if you said it, it's got to be true. Hi, everybody. <laughs> when she dies, she wants to leave her body to science fiction, Teresa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he drives way too fast to worry about cholesterol, Scott. <laughs> what other way is there to drive? <laughs> Guys, welcome back. Have you been drinking again, Kevin, <laughs> before you turned us on? Well, now you know the recipe for the show. <laughs> That's right, he's got me turned on. <laughs> Look at those legs over there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're all going to have to pass the bottle before we start. So at least we're, we're all at the same degree of non-sobriety and can answer your quickies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. We're going to have a great show today. We're going to be talking to Jonathan Baker about climate change. All your questions about climate change, we're going to be talking about that today. But first, a little bit of chit-chat. Guys, did you hear that Adam West is dead? Oh, no, I missed it. At the age of 88 years old, Adam West, Batman. Oh. And very sympathetic character. You know, I always got that impression. Yeah. He will be missed. Yeah. I mean, he, uh, he was struggling to get roles after his... Uh, Turn as Batman in the uh, was it sixties and seventies? Sixties, sixties. It was sixty six. But he 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 bounced back when he got some uh, voice over work, uh, especially as the uh, mayor of uh, in the show Family Guy from Seth MacFarlane. Yeah, he but created he, such a buzz back when the series started yeah, yeah. that no one could visualize him in any other role except that of, of exactly. Batman. Exactly. I just hope he made a ton of money to, so you know he he made it through the the leaner times. Yes, I hope so too. So anyway, Adam West dead at the age of eighty eight. Uh, did you guys follow the British election? A little bit. A little bit. Uh, that a little was bit. A, that just, was interesting. Just a bit. The uh, the conservative leader Theresa May. Uh, had a uh, a majority, and uh, her polls were uh, fa- favorable, and she thought she would call a snap election to get herself a bigger majority uh, to uh, because they're about to negotiate Brexit. So she really wanted a big mandate. Well, that fired back spectacularly on her. She just about lost. Go! Now she's in a minority government. Looks good on her. <laughs> <laughs> and she actually has to make an alliance with a uh, Irish party. And the funny- well, this should go well. Well, th- that's the funny thing, right? Because what people don't realize here is she's supposed to go negotiate Brexit. But when b- the whole Brexit vote happened, the Irish didn't want it to leave. So now they hold the balance of power. Can you just imagine the meetings the Irish side of this are holding right now? No. Oh. They're, they're in meetings right now going, exactly how do we step on this one? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, and... Uh, I got a letter from our friend Del Ray. We had Del Ray last week, and uh, I, I, I have to read. He sent us a letter, and uh, he's actually quite angry at us. No! Uh-oh. Yeah, oh, says, no. Kevin, listen to the end of the episode today. I noted a grievous error. <gasps> you referred to me as one of the high priests of the flying spaghetti monster. That is incorrect. I am a the high priest <laughs> <laughs> of the fly spaghetti monster. There is only one high priest. I am higher than the Pope and the Dalai Lama combined. <laughs> Errors like this can have serious consequences, like getting no pasta in flying spaghetti monster heaven or a reduced ration of meatballs. Just a friendly warning. Thanks again for having me on the show. <laughs> So well, I, took- I say we challenge him to prove it. I want to see his driver's <laughs> license photo. So, Dr. Ray, I withdraw that, that, that comment, and I reinstate that Del Ray is the high priest of the Flying Spaghetti Monster Church. Where's his yeah. colander? <laughs> <laughs> 
He is a colander. He's, <laughs> he's beyond just having a colander. He is, he is a colander. Oh, abject apologies all Absolutely, around. Dr. Ray, and we love Dr. Ray. We'll have him back on somewhere during the summer to talk about a recovery from religion. Uh, Nancy, you must have followed the uh, Comey testifying before, before Senate. Oh, yeah. What do you think? I, I think what Comey did, other than telling the truth, was to lay the foundation for either obstruction of justice or eventual impeachment. He laid, I mean, the man was the head of the FBI. He knows how to give testimony, you know. So I think it was a, uh, I think it was a good presentation. I was um, really gladdened by the fact that the Republicans on the committee were um, just as probing, or asked questions that were just as probing as the Democrats mm -hmm. did, with very few exceptions. And um, Burr, who is the chairman, he and Mark Warner get along well, and th th it was, to me, a, a, one of the most impartial uh, hearings. So I think he laid the foundation. Um, we're going to have to see what what happens after that, but I think it was a, it was a, a positive step, letting people know that the system works. Yeah, I think, uh, however, I think a lot of people were disappointed, especially the Democrats, because they were hoping for a smoking gun. They were hoping that they to have some kind of revelation that would say Trump needs to be impeached now, and that didn't happen. Uh, although he did say that he took notes, Comey took a lot of notes because he didn't trust Trump. Exactly. So that was that was interesting in itself, but nothing, you know. Stop the press, and now and so. Well, no, there was nothing that there was no there, there was no smoking. There, there was no gun in his hand for it to be smoking. There mm -hmm. was nothing absolutely recorded or or videotaped. And in, impeachment and obstruction in, obstruction of justice takes a long time. But I heard one of the uh, the radio commentators um, um, really. I thought phrased it exactly perfect he said this isn't impeachment yet but it's the i yeah. in impeachment so we've got 10 more letters to go but the i is definitely a part of the the program we'll see what happens i, yeah. I, I have a feeling that trump is going to stay there his full four years I, uh, anyway speaking of politics uh, let's switch to canadian politics did you guys know it is no longer illegal to challenge somebody to a duel i challenge you to a duel in Canada. <laughs> no. It used to be illegal, right? Um, the Minister of Justice, uh, Jody Wilson uh, Raybould, uh, she, uh, so she, she brought in some legislation that would amend or repeal provision in the criminal code, and challenging a duel is one of them. The last deadly duel in Canada was in 1838 in Quebec, and only about 300 duels have occurred in the, from the mid 1600s to 1948 in Canada. Huh. So, so now, Scott, I can challenge you to a duel. Where's my glove? The white glove? <laughs> yeah, and, and choice of weapon. What weapon, now that you've Water challenged gun. him, what weapon? Water gun. <laughs> yeah, who, who gets to choose the weapons? The guy who challenges or the guy who has to respond? Usually well, the you, one who issues the challenge. Well, you, okay, you, could well, actually, you could actually do a duel now uh, using, uh, like, laser tag. Oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because first person to get shot is, is down, right? I, I still like the 10 paces turn around and water gun thing. I think that's cool. There's no way to pick a winner, though. Well, slow motion camera, you can see which one got hit first, <laughs> or how bad your aim is, or <laughs> how bad your aim is. <laughs> um, something interesting here, did you guys know that uh, they found the oldest fossils of Homo sapiens in Morocco? Ah. Uh, it suggests that the species actually evolved across multiple locations in Africa, and not just in the Ethiopian va Valley, as we've always uh, been uh, taught. Until now, the oldest fossils were about 195,000 years old. Uh, these fossils now date back to 300,000. So they've pushed wow. back Homo sapien by 100,000 years. That's yep. amazing. It is. Well, the fact that the, they're the fact, the theory mm -hmm. that uh, multiple locations across Africa now, that's more believable than coming the out single, of, out of single coming valley. out of one valley. It, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So anyway, um, the, these uh, fossils were found in a region called Jebel Irud, and they were uh, sophisticated, and uh, and uh, they could uh, craft weapons needed to hunt gazelles that graze on the Sahara 300,000 years ago before it was actually a desert. So mm. that's a very interesting piece of our prehistory. 
It is. Mm. So. Every time we think we got, you know, the sequence nailed down, something else comes up, which is wonderful. You can't. The you really can't get too complacent if you're, if you're a science scientist yeah. studying evolution and the beginning, the origins of man. Exactly. Something else it, is going to. It's the big come plus up. with science. Yeah, is exactly. That you always can find better answers. You can always keep moving the knowledge forward. Yeah, and that's. Okay, well, I'm going to do something different here because usually we do it after, but uh, there is something coming up, and I believe it's going to be Scott's birthday. Oh, come oh. on. Oh. Yeah. It's a bit ahead of time, buddy, but happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thanks, when is guys. When is the absolute, when is the date, the actual? The 12th. <gasps> Wow. That's right around the corner. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so you're turning 27 yep. with some years of experience. With some years of experience. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. Oh, great. Well, have, every, a, have a wonderful every day. Every year I 12. get closer and closer to not having to uh, bleach my hair out to do Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the people yeah. don't know that uh, Scott actually uh, does a Santa Claus, a very good Santa Claus, every year or so. So they say. So they say. I've never yeah. sat on my own lap to know. but <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, we don't want to see that. <laughs> Carrying flexible a little too far, but we'll go with it. <laughs> Are we doing a Disney in history or a quack watch? Uh, let's do this day in history. We haven't done a day in history for a couple of weeks, so we'll pull that out of the rabbit's it's all up to you, then. Ears today. All righty. Uh, we're going to do this day in history, which is a roundup of those events and people that altered and illuminated the days between June the 5th and June the 11th. Uh, June the 6th is Teacher's Day in Bolivia. And this is a this is a lovely little little story. It has a it's it's not um, you know really exciting. It's not really terrible. It's not the extremes, but it's a it's a it's a good story. So we'll we'll share that. In 1896, quite a while ago, two Norwegian guys from New York, Frank Samuelson and George Harbo, left New York Harbor to row across the Atlantic. <laughs> and they wow. actually set a 55-day record for rowing that was not broken for 114 uh, years. That's oh. insane. Yeah, it is insane. <clears throat> but the, the reason they did it was that in 1896, the same year, uh, a New York police gazette offered $10,000 as a prize to anyone who could row across the Atlantic from America to Europe. Um, and that would be from New York to La Havre. George and Frank uh, were bored with their lives as New Jersey fishermen, so they accepted the challenge, and they hoped it would change their lives and fortunes by becoming celebrity adventurers and, and uh, ca get cash or whatever would be maybe a, a lucrative lecture tour around Europe and the U USA. So they had an 18-foot wooden skiff that they named Fox, which was named after the guy who sponsored the prize money. Um, and they had provisions for the journey, and they left in the spring. And they had a lot of adventures. They were lucky in that they, I believe they followed some of the, the ship channels, mm. and so they had a chance to meet up with people and also uh, replenish their supplies. But it, it wasn't a, a, an easy trip, you can imagine, you know, going across the Atlantic even in spring. So um, they reached Europe, and news of their success was sent back by telegraph to New York and so forth and so on and the fishermen loaded up their boat put it on a steamer headed right back to New York where all the way back they were thinking oh boy headlines oh boy 10,000 bucks wow and uh, and that would be equal I mean if today they got it that's like 500,000 bucks so it, it, it's a lot of money so the steamboat coming back across the Atlantic ran out of coal on the coast of Cape Cod, and the captain ordered all wooden objects to be burned in the oh, storm oh, no. in order to make steam for the remainder of the trip. So the two fishermen, pretty smart Norwegian guys, launched their boat over the side of the steamer and rowed back <laughs> <laughs> to New York because they thought, 100,000 bucks, 100,000 bucks, fame and fortune. You mean 10,000 bucks? Pardon? 10,000 bucks. 10,000 bucks, right. I'm sorry. So much to their dismay, they reached New York, went to the newspaper, no prize money. The what? Guy, it was a total scam. They oh. never collected a nickel. 
and there, you know, and they actually they did. They they got a Swedish prize of a couple of kroners, but <laughs> oh <my God>. but <laughs> other than that, and this is when you know, the first murder of the year occurred. <laughs> yeah, so wow. all they ended up with was a couple of medals, and they returned to fishing, and um, they uh, they both eventually died. You know, years later, but what they did spawned an extreme sport. So although it took 114 years for someone to break their uh, 55-day journey, the, the, it was broken by 33 days. Now it's considered a sport, and people do it solo and in couples and in four in teams of four. Mm. And it's still going on. It's still it's going so on today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it's so strange because I just read in the paper there's a big race that's going on right now from. Uh, from the UK to the United States to Rhode Island, and they just ran into trouble in a storm. Oh. It was big, big sailing race, yeah. and they ran into trouble in a storm, and it, it mobilized all of the. As a matter of fact, the Queen Mary, the Queen Mary too, picked up one of the boat's uh, wow. uh, occupants. Yeah. There was five boats involved, all in trouble. So <laughs> it's yeah. strange to see people uh, 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 rowing across I, without I the know. equipment. Right? That's scary. It, it's it it is it is scary. It'd make a great great movie or oh, documentary. Would. That would make it? an awesome. Yeah. Movie. How many times yeah. can you start singing "Row, row, row your boat" when you're going across the Atlantic? Eventually, <laughs> you never want to hear that song. <laughs> <laughs> or what happens? <laughs> two of you in the boat and you get ticked off at each other. Yeah, I and mean, there's nowhere to go. There's it's no not like you, <laughs> you have to be compatible. It's like living in an RV. You have oh, to yeah. be compatible before you start, or you know, you're going to abandon that RV and go on <laughs> screaming into the woods. It's the nearest opportunity. <laughs> Moving on to June seventh, I do like that story. There, as I said, it's that not is really so neat, but it That's is. It's story. one of those neat adventure and great disappointment. Pardon? I wonder why no one's made a movie of it. Well, there's your million dollar no idea. idea. Write a script, send it to Hollywood. Yeah, there you go, Scott. Oh, that involves a lot of research. I don't think I'm up to that. To <laughs> I'll help you. I'll, I'll help you with the research. That's right. You're good at it. That's right. I'll help you. Uh, June 7th is Journalist Day in Argentina. And in 1989, the famous Rain Gretzky won his ninth NHL Hart Trophy. The great one. In 10 years. Good old Wayne. Uh, June 8th, World Oceans Day. And in 1824, the washing machine was patented by Noel Cushing of Quebec. There we go. Yeah, how about that? The first washing pat- machine it, is a Quebec invention? And it was the first patent issued in Canada. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Holy news. cow. See, for all these people that say the French aren't clean, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Screw you. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that one. Yeah. Two, two really nice, quick stories. Um... And June 8th in 1920 was the only time a Major League Baseball player was ejected from a game from sleeping. (laughs) I love these these baseball stories. Uh, The Cincinnati Reds and New York Giants were playing a game, and in the eighth inning, an argument started, (laughs) why not, at uh, home plate about a foul ball. So Eddie Roush, the outfielder, uh, fielder put his glove and cap on the ground, lay down, and just took a nap because he realized <laughs> this isn't this isn't going to end, you know, anytime soon. It was a sunny day; it was warm, so the coach sends the third baseman uh, to wake him up. But he, at that point, he's in a deep sleep, and the ump re- ejects him for a. Uh, delay and it cost him the game five to four. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, but yeah. he expressed exactly how everybody feels when they're watching baseball. I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, despite that, uh, Roush was inducted in the Hall of Fame in 1962, along with Jackie Robinson, Bob Feller, and uh, Bill M- McKenzie. So he was in good company. Um, actually, Roush was voted the greatest Reds player in history, despite the nap. Maybe because of the nap, <laughs> you know, he's got a little rest. And yeah, I think they did a movie on his life too. Yeah, that was, was a sleeper hit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, this is a this is a fun way to end end uh, the segment. June tenth, World Naked Bike Ride Day Ooh, comes World every Naked year. Bike Ride Day. Yeah, in, in, in Bellingham, which is close to us, they have it on June the second. So they already had theirs, and they had two hundred and fifty riders. I think theirs has been going on five or six years at, at least and they, they always get a, a pretty good turnout. Um, it started in 2004 
and it's an international clothing optional bike ride. And uh, the participants plan, meet, and ride together to deliver a vision of a cleaner, safer, body positive world. Cleaner, safer? Put a towel on that bicycle. Seat, right? <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. I, I don't want to touch that bike seat after anybody's ridden yeah. on it naked. Well, I'll tell you how popular it is. It, it's in at least 74 cities, 17 countries from the United States to the UK and Hungary and Paraguay. I'm, I'm hoping that shoes are mandatory on this ride. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess I'm it just, depends on you know how much of a hardy. Well, I just remember you are. the. the the bicycle pedals that I had on my bikes were always metal the spiked. Yeah, spike they were the spiked one, yeah. metal ones that would claw your. Uh, yeah, so I so, so I guess we're hurt. not participating <laughs> next year in the naked bike. No, Nobody Teresa, you want to do the naked bike ride with me next year? I was in it last year. You were in it last no, year. <laughs> <laughs> I must have. I must have missed you. <laughs> That's okay. We'll do it. We'll do it again. She started on a bicycle. She finished on a unicycle. <laughs> And on that note, dear listeners, that's a close to another passing parade of interesting, mundane, unusual, and occasionally bizarre events and people that make up this day in history. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nancy, for this always entertaining segment. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's really fun fun looking all of this stuff up. Yeah. But it's all true. It's all true. Oh, goodness. So before we go to commercial and we have our uh, friend Jonathan join us, let's do another brilliant moment brought to you by religion. I got three nice little quick stories for you guys. Well, actually, one of them is quick. I'll start with that one. Uh, So there's a 31-year-old man who decided to get a tattoo, and he got a tattoo of a crucifix and praying hands, and unfortunately this man died in the worst possible way. He ignored warnings that you gotta wait at least two weeks before going to swim, uh, swimming, and he decided to take a dip in the Gulf of Mexico uh. five days after getting his tattoo. Ooh. And that's when the flesh eating bacteria came. Oh. oh! Way to protect him, Jesus. Yeah. Oh. So, unfortunately, this was all described in a new article in the British Medical Journal, and he was admitted to a hospital, and by, the, by, by which time his leg had turned purple. A uh, doctor immediately suspected the uh, uh, vibrio. Uh, Volnificus bug in the patient's uh, cirrhosis of the liver from years of heavy drinking. So it That's didn't help. Right. Jesus said you have to walk on the water, not swim in it. There we go. That's now his problem. <laughs> that's what. That's what the problem was. Well, poor guy. I guess the power of Jesus wasn't strong enough to save him. No, because he was in the water, not on it. That's right. It's that just means... a shame. Shame somebody had to die to, you know. It's interpretation. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, here's a story. Uh, an Oklahoma lawmaker says, rape and incest are of the will of God. Uh, oh, my. This is the Oklahoma state rep, George Fought, argues that rape and incest are the will of God while defending anti-abortion legislation. The Oklahoma House approved House Bill 1549, also called the Prenatal Non-Discrimination Act of 2017. The controversial legislation would prohibit abortion when the fetus is diagnosed with Down syndrome and, or any other birth defect. So in Oklahoma, even if your child has has a, a big issue, or your child, or you your fetus, I say, I should say, uh, you cannot get an abortion. Honestly, but Oklahoma and Texas are competing for the stupid oh, they, prize of the century. Oh, yeah. I, they, both states have de, have really degraded in the last five years. Don't forget South Carolina, and they weren't that yeah. high to begin with. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they, they're just going insane down there. They are. They're, it did, I don't know whether it's the Red River that's polluting on both sides of the of the border or what, but something's getting at them. So when he was discussing the legislation before the vote, uh, the bill's author said uh, when it comes to abortion, people are being allowed to play God. So while discussing false legislation on the House floor, uh, Representative Regina Goodwin asked, at what point did you decide that it's within your ability to decide for all women in Oklahoma? So Ford replied, one of the things that I campaigned on was to protect life, and I believe life begins at conception. At one point, Republi- uh, uh, Representative Corey Williams, he's a Democrat, asked Fought if the rape is the will of God. So Fought responded, Well, you know, if you read the Bible, there's actually a couple of circumstances where that happened. The Lord uses these circumstances. I mean, you can go down that path, but it's really unfortunate. So Williams fought up with if the ask if the incest was also the will of God. And Fought answers, same answer. Doesn't deal with the spell. So this guy obviously doesn't have a freaking clue. No. Sick. Yeah, and, and he, an office. He, that I mean, that's you know, if he was just somewhere out in the 
the country, you know, in a farm someplace or in a nice small town where it didn't matter, let him live his life. But the fact that he's using his religion as a club to get everyone under control in the state exactly. you know, well, that, is a, that, it's an that, elected that's representative. Kind of, that's kind of scary, too, because it's there's that scary. father in Alberta who's uh, going to trial right now for uh, incest with his three daughters, and then he's been charged also with selling the one daughter for sex. Ooh, you suck! Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen that story. <clears throat> yeah, I read that. It was in uh, Google. Nothing like Google's a family business. Feed, right? Oh, geez. Uh, okay, well, just, here's, a, know, here's another uh, he horror must be. story. Yeah. Um, so there's a Christian congressman in the, in the States uh, that uh, is calling for a holy war against Islam. <laughs> a holy war against holy war. Islam. Didn't yeah. we try that back in the uh, around 1000 AD? Yeah, yeah. It was nice. called the Dark Ages, right? And, <laughs> and, uh, and So Armageddon, here we come. Republican Congress Clay Higgins is calling for a, whole, a Christian holy war against Islamic horror. This is writing on his Facebook page. Louisiana Rep, uh, Representative Clay Higgins declared that, quote, every single Islamic, not jihadist or ISIS, suspect should be hunted down and killed. Whoa. This is on his Facebook page. Declaring, kill them Genocide. all. Genocide. Yeah, kill them all for the sake of that is uh, all that is good and righteous. Kill them all. This is this is a congressman. That's a scary, yeah, it is. and I think scary. I may be wrong. I may have, I be me making this whole thing up, but I think I read somewhere that he has been reported to the ethics committee for yes. his remarks. Yes, I believe that's in there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in this post, Higgins says that all Christendom is at war with Islamic horror. The free world, all of Christendom. I don't know why he says the free world. He equates that with Christendom right away. You know, Christendom and free world are not the same thing. They're just not. Um, he says not one penny of American treasure should be granted to any nation who harbors these heathens, animals. See what he's doing there? He's dehuman, dehumanizing uh-huh. them already. Not a single radicalized Islamic suspect should be granted any measure of of quarter. They intend uh, they in, their intended entry to the American homeland should be summarily uh, summarily denied. Every conceivable measure should be engaged to hunt them down, hunt them, identify them, and kill them. Kill them all for the sake of what is good and righteous. Kill them all. Wow, you know, this is I, a congressman. <clears throat> well, the, uh, not only is he a congressman, I think he forgot that there are a couple of Muslim congressmen that are serving with him. M- abs- must have slipped his mind. But I'm I'm sure they <laughs> maybe they were the ones that reported it to the ethics committee. But uh, un- un- unbelievable! Yeah. Isn't there something about promoting genocide that I mean he's promoting genocide? Yeah, and there's got to be some kind of international treaty on promoting genocide well, against you, it. You know, we we had we had guests here in the past that were talking about. Uh, remember uh, uh, Jim. Remember Jim that was uh, here on the show and yeah. he, he he talked about he he actually thought that the only way to get rid of ISIS is to kill all the jihadists. He actually said that, and to some extent that does make sense. But this guy's going one step further. He's talking about everybody that's Muslim, and uh, that's just completely wrong. And this is well, a man in a position of power. Even right. even even the first idea is completely wrong. We we live in a society where we have laws and we have rules, and there's there's rules of engagement. Just because someone has done has wronged you doesn't mean that you get to kill them freely. You have to hold a trial. You have to have evidence. You have to. Yeah, you know, there's, I, there's just there's a way of going about it. You can't just go and say let's kill them all. Well, what Jim at the time said is that these people will or, or these jihadists, ISIS, for example, they're completely unrepentant. You can't you can't save them. You can't. Well, that, these guys that's are just fine. That's extreme. That's, extreme. that's the religion, not their not their personhood. I mean, yeah. So anyway, so it's scary to think about that. But there's a lesson from these two last stories wow. that needs to be learned scary. from the average atheist. Um, I think the average atheist needs to start coming out and start getting active on the political spectrum. Uh, because just the fact that I was t- telling this yesterday to, to at dinner, just because we have a tendency to say, oh, well, we have truth on our side. We live in a world that truth is not enough. It's not enough. Uh, truth doesn't make it uh, necessarily all the time on the front page, right? Uh, we've had we way to too many lies in, in politics, and people that are lying in politics, getting into power, and then committing atrocities. So we need to, to get a bit more active. 
Yeah, and, and hopefully he'll be sanctioned. I, I just wonder whether or not uh, Trump's stance on the travel ban and all of the things Is that helping? he said during uh, the the campaign emboldened people like this to voice that thinking. Oh well, that's that. I'm, I'm that's sure. where we're headed. I'm sure so we're headed I feel back, yeah. you know I feel as though I'm uh, just saying what everybody is thinking, but not willing to say out loud. And it's um, I'm just hoping that we can uh, report sometime soon that that there were sanctions. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, this guy, uh, I think a lot of people are naturally cowards. Yeah. And, you know, if this was under President Obama, this guy would not have said something like that, right? But because it's Trump now, he feels like he can't. I think so. So uh, it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on that. Yeah. Anyway, let's go to commercial for now, and uh, will we come right back, and we'll be with uh, Jonathan Baker and discuss climate change. Stay with us. Do you know where Saskatchewan is? Probably not. It's in Canada. If you do, you might know a city named Regina. In Regina, there's a studio. And in that studio, there are, at least once a month, a bunch of skeptical atheist geeks and goofballs who get together to do a podcast. We are the Brainstorm Crew, and we're trying to help spread a bit of reason and critical thinking while still having fun. Never taking things too seriously, but still not accepting everything we're told, we go through different topics, exploring them in depth, and often disagreeing. We try to stick to provable facts, and we never trust a myth. That's why we say we're woo-free since 2000. 2013. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker under Brainstorm. Or check out our website, brainstormblog.net. I can't promise you'll always agree with us, but I can promise you'll have fun listening to us. Hi, I'm the Supreme Irreverend Dr. Randy Tyson from the Legion of Reason Diversion. Join me and my co-hosts, Christine Shelska, Twyla, and Nate Phelps, as we explore issues at the intersection of atheism, humanism, and skepticism. Topics range from alternative medicine to the interference of religion in public policy. We often have special guests to help us understand the topic du jour. Previous guests include biologist Jerry Coyne, ex-Muslim author Ali Rizvi, philosopher Peter Bogosian, and the late physicist Victor Stanger. You can watch us on the Legion of Reason YouTube channel or subscribe to the audio version through your favorite podcatcher such as iTunes or Stitcher. And don't forget to like the Legion of Reason Facebook page. If your skepticism is socially conscious and doesn't take itself too seriously, you might like life, the universe, and everything else. People like Ray Comfort are fond of saying, what use is half a wing, right? Have you ever seen a f***ing penguin? <laughs> Life, the universe, and everything else. Available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else. I don't know, Zoom? Is that still a thing? And we're back. So our next guest has a master's in geoscience and finishing his PhD in paleoclimatology. Oh, now that's a big word for Scrabble. His research with isotopes to reconstruct past climate change. His research uses isotopes to reconstruct climate change. He's a snappy dresser and a snazzy dancer. Jonathan Baker. Jonathan, hi. Yeah. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I'm tripping all over nice and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin's just having a rough morning. I'm having a rough morning. It's one of those days. Uh, Jonathan, uh, would you be so kind to give us a, a, a quick Reader's Digest version of who you are and what you do? Who I am? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think you said it. My focus in geology has been uh, stable isotope geochemistry. Uh, so mainly looking at the stable isotope uh, signatures in carbon and oxygen that form in limestone. And I've looked at uh, marine limestones that are very old, you know, old Paleozoic limestones. I've looked at more recent uh, limestones. And uh, the thing is, in, you know, locked in their chemistry is we, we get a record of global and environmental and climatic changes over time. So that's been the focus of my research. I began uh, graduate studies uh, at least seven years ago. And like you said, I'm just finishing up those now. Finally uh, managed to get a few things published and... Uh, Trying to see what's next, but um, that's that's a short version of who I am. So, so you're not just a paleoclimatologist. So you study climate, but you also study ancient climate, especially. Uh, specifically, yes. Wow. You know, and a big part of that is uh, looking at the modern uh, environments and using 
the modern environments as a tool to uh, interpret what's recorded in, in the geologic record. Mm-hmm. So since you have a tendency to study ancient fossils and all that, can I introduce you to my parents? No, just kidding. (laughs) I thought you were going to say, let me introduce you to Nancy. (laughs) I guess I surely you wouldn't do that to me. No, no, no. Not Uh, live anyway. (laughs) Not live anyway. But you could have. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us, Jonathan. Uh, So I I guess uh, I just want to go into uh, a a bit of an examination as to why it is that people think that uh, climate change, some people think that climate change is not happening. And uh, what are your thoughts about the whole debate, if there, you can even say there is one? <laughs> well, I, I think we can say safely that scientifically there isn't uh, much debate. And I have to clarify uh, very specifically what I mean by that. So I think there's a, there's a tendency to use phrases like settled science, like, hey, you know, just... Just stop uh, trying to debate it. It's already settled and uh, move on and accept it. Um, it's, it's something of a dangerous phase because it's not well interpreted. Uh, I put it this way. By what we know uh, without much question is we, we know the major things that affect Earth's climate. Uh, we do that by studying modern climates and ancient ones. Uh, one thing that affects Earth's climate are are changes in the composition of the atmosphere. And you can see that just looking at the solar system, the difference between the climate in Mars versus Venus versus Earth. You know, we know that the composition of the atmosphere has a huge impact. And we can see the changes in the composition of Earth's atmosphere just in the past hundred years uh, have significantly impacted its uh, surface climate. Okay, so, so, so well, sorry, a quick question, but I can butt in there. When you yeah. say you're studying the climate on Mars, how yes. do you determine exactly what the climate on Mars is? <laughs> well, it's it's not nearly as well monitored, to be sure, but we do um, we do have a sense of say uh, average day and nighttime temperatures, uh, uh, a sense of how how seasonal it is. Uh, we could just look at the average temperature. Um, Based, you can calculate this. A, a physicist could calculate this. In, in any case, how warm uh, the surface of Mars should be given its distance from the Sun and its path of orbit. You could do that the same for uh, Earth and Venus. In fact, this was done for Earth uh, many, many years ago, and it was determined that uh, Earth's surface is much warmer than you would expect it to be given how far we are from the Sun. Uh, and that that really began over 100 years ago, investigations into uh, how our atmosphere, how gases in the atmosphere actually uh, hold on to heat or reflect it out and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, so looking at Mars, for example, it's, um, it's a very thin atmosphere, and so it's uh, much colder overall than, than uh, if Earth were the same distance as Mars. Uh, Mars is much colder than uh, our planet would be at that distance, uh, just for the difference in the atmosphere. It also has much higher temperature swings between day and night. Uh, you know, compare that with Venus, which is much, much warmer, you know, by several hundreds of degrees, uh, and also doesn't have huge temperature swing, uh, temperature swings between day and night. That's because it's a mostly carbon dioxide atmosphere. Uh, it's very buffered because you've got a lot of gases that trap that heat and, and lock it in. So, th- but this is just one factor. We know that, uh, changes in solar output, uh, which are minor, but they do have an impact on Earth's climate, uh, changes in its, uh, surface, uh, well, everything from plate tectonics, the arrangement of the continent, continents, the uh, level of the oceans, uh, the types of vegetation that cover the Earth and how, what kind of area they cover, you know, the amount of ice that covers the Earth, uh, both on land and sea, uh, ocean currents, and everything plays a part. It's a very complex portrait. But given that complex portrait, what we do know uh, with, you know, it's as much certainty as we can at the, at the moment. We do know that uh, changing any one of those variables will impact the climate on a long-term scale. And uh, the changes we've made to the composition of the atmosphere have indeed uh, caused Earth's climate system to trap more heat than it did before and raise the global temperature and affect a number of other uh, small systems. So, you know, that's, that's the settled part. Uh, given that it's uh, such a complex uh, system. I mean, there's still much to research. In fact, the, you know, the word research implies that we keep searching for the answer even when we think we have it, right? Uh, and so the fact that there is ongoing research about climate change doesn't mean that uh, we don't know uh, quite simply that Earth's climate is warming and that humans are mainly responsible. Um, I, I mean, I would put it this way, a lack of 
comprehensive knowledge does not imply a comprehensive lack of knowledge. And I think there's a tendency in society to say, well, if you don't have everything together, if you don't have this, you know, uh, perfectly defined and ready to put it down in a book of law, then it's it's open for debate and mm. I'm free to reject it as I will. And this is a topic, uh, like many scientific topics, that uh, most people are uh, have a tendency to reject. They're ready to reject it or at least be dismissive of it. Not necessarily reject it, but just, you know, not pay too much attention to what scientists say and, and they're not too worried if what they think contradicts uh, the majority of scientists. It's interesting because you wouldn't you wouldn't approach most topics in science this way. You wouldn't approach gravity this way, although, you know, gravidly, gra the gravitational theory is a widely debated and researched uh, theory within physics. Uh, there's still a lot to know, uh, but that doesn't mean that, um, you know, somebody would freely jump out of the plane thinking, you know, I, I don't know if this gravity thing is real. It, it may or may not pull me down to the surface of the Earth. Mm -hmm fast enough to kill me you know mm -hmm. uh, we, they don't approach other topics this way but but here uh, you've got a topic that does have implications not simply for scientific in, uh, inquisition and, and curiosity but it has serious implications uh, on political and moral scales as well uh, so it's it's one of those fields uh, like the age of the earth the origin the physical origin of the cosmos and um, uh, biological evolution these things, tend to have implications beyond our scientific curiosities. They imply what we think about uh, our place in the universe and uh, our morality and so forth. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I, th I think you, you're making some very good points here, uh, especially on the morality side of things, because I think that uh, if, uh, especially from a religious point of view, if you were to admit that climate change was real, because let's face it, the, most of the proponents against climate change are of the Christian persuasion. If they were to admit there was such a thing as climate change, then you're admitting all of a sudden that God is not in control. And I think that's where we're heading with that. Uh, but you are yourself studying paleoclimatology. Mm -hmm. You're studying climate in the past. How exactly do you guys do that? Um, we look for, we look at what are called proxies. You know, there's, you don't have thermometers that directly record um, temperatures in the past. You don't have uh, weather forecasters writing down what the cloud cover was and weather patterns are and how much rain fell. Uh, but we do have uh, things in nature that respond to these processes, predictably so. Uh, one, what I look at specifically are stable isotopes, uh, let's say in oxygen. You know, oxygen, 99% uh, of oxygen, or oxygen atoms on Earth uh, have eight protons and eight neutrons. That's a total mass of 16. Um, but the other uh, small portion have either 17, a total mass of 17 or 18. So there are oxygen atoms that are slightly heavier than the other ones. Um, what happens when water, say, evaporates from the ocean? Uh, one of these isotopes, the lighter isotope, is preferred in the process. It's a little bit easier for lighter oxygen to evaporate. And so it separates out predictably uh, in a different proportion. So water vapor in the atmosphere has a different isotope signature than water in the ocean. And that difference is temperature dependent. So we could look at things like, uh, you know, I'd look specifically at cave formations. You know, so water evaporates in the ocean, it moves across land, it falls to the ground as rain or snow, it infiltrates through the ground and say drips through a cave and forms something like a stalagmite. Uh, and when that forms, it uh, records the oxygen isotope chemistry of the rain or snow that fell there as the cave was forming. I had no idea! Right, and so we can look at changes in the chemistry as a proxy for changes in temperature, climate, uh, weather patterns, and so forth. Hmm. Guys, I hope you took notice of that. There's a pop quiz, right? <laughs> well, you know, John, Jonathan, I'm, I'm going to interrupt your, your narrative here just for a bit because I hear mm -hmm. the enthusiasm and the passion and the knowledge, and um, which I appreciate because this is all, all new to me. And, and because you're so enthusiastic, I, I can get into it a lot, a lot better than if someone was just giving a dry lecture. So I, I appreciate <laughs> that. But what I'm, what I'm also wondering about as I listen to you is how did you get into this field of of research, what what drew you to this particular um, subject, and question. and what keeps that passion alive for you? <laughs> well, it may be a uh, maybe more boring story than you're looking for. I mean, I <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're you're not a, you're not a boring person, and this is a this is an interesting <laughs> well, topic. So go for it, buddy. Yeah, obviously, obviously, you know, you're, you're, so you're growing boring. up. I, I did have an interest in science. Uh, my my dad was a biology teacher, and you know encouraged me to study it. So I 
it, it was something that was interest of me as a child. And, and so by the time I got into college, I was looking to be some sort of science major. I was, you know, not extremely passionate about uh, one thing or another. But, you know, the field of biology fascinated me and it seemed like a field where we had a lot to learn. So uh, I started working on that and it, it was OK. But most of the biology students at my school were pre-med and pre-dental students and all treating it like a competition, you know, where I got to get better grades than you so I got I can get the better spot in med school and so forth. And that wasn't my um, my goal or passion. So it was not a. Uh, it was, it was just not that fun. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I took a geology all, really for fun as, as a science elective. Um, I didn't really need it, but um, it, it turned out that my middle school physics teacher was an adjunct professor in geology at uh, the college where I was attending, and uh, she taught the class. I took it, and I realized that geology was also I mean, probably more so a field where we've got a lot to learn. There are many questions you can ask. Uh, and I think that's that's a hallmark of of a fascinating field where um, the real challenge is not how many answers you can come up with, but uh, how many questions you can come up with, because that's really what drives you to keep going. Right. Uh, when you think you have all the answers, that's when the curiosity stops. So geology was precisely that field. Um, when I mean, when I studied geology, my main interests were, uh, you know, sedimentary rock formations how it recorded past environments, you, you know, being able to tell the difference between rocks deposited uh, in the middle of the continent, in deserts, in lakes and rivers, at, you know, on the coastline and so forth. Uh, being able to interpret past environments that way was, it was fascinating to me. When I got to graduate school, uh, my advisor was more uh, looking at this more from a geochemistry side, and he introduced me to the concept of stable isotope geochemistry and how that's used to add uh, a layer of understanding to sedimentary rocks. And so that's what I got to study. It wasn't until my doctoral work that I really um, started to focus on climate change, well, especially modern climate change. And by modern, I mean anything covering the last, you know, since the last ice age, the last 10 to 20,000 years. Okay, so I guess that comes into the question I was about to ask. So what <laughs> can you tell us about the climate of the past and how far back can you guys go? So the further back you go, the spottier the record becomes. That doesn't mean we uh, know nothing. It's just uh, our our comprehension uh, increases as you get closer to the modern period, as you would expect. Um, but we can say a few things about uh, early Earth climate, you know, several billions of years ago. Wow, that far. Huh? Yeah. I mean, you, you can say something. And by something, I mean, you can get a general sense of the composition of the atmosphere, uh, how much of the Earth was covered by ocean versus continent. Uh, we do have records of several Ice Age episodes. Uh, we can look at the isotope signature to see that it was very, very stable for long periods of time. And there were a few uh, episodes where several, you know, for several millions of years, it cooled off very rapidly and uh, stayed almost frozen for a, a number of times. Um, you know, so it's, it's fascinating. You, ha you have these things like the uh, the Snowball Earth Ice Ages where you know, some 90% of the planet was covered in snow and ice. Mm. Uh, and you've got, we've got, uh, where I studied in northern Utah, we've got um, deposits of, or sorry, glacial deposits uh, from about 670 million years ago. And these deposits were uh, laid down in a time when that part of Utah was probably 10 degrees north latitude. And so if you've got uh, ice age deposits down in the tropics, that tells you something about global um, global climate. But I mean, we, we uh, so we do have these long term records. You don't have the same resolution as you do today, but we have a general sense of uh, how Earth's temperature went up and down, how stable it was. There are a few episodes where it changed rapidly, uh, like we're seeing today. And those episodes of rapid climate change, we tend to they. Uh, are called mass extinctions. <laughs> That's one of the reasons we have an interest in modern climate change and are so concerned about it. Because every time we, uh, every time this happened in the past, to our knowledge, it resulted in uh, something quite catastrophic to Earth's uh, ecosystem. So when you when you look at the, at the climate in the past and you see these mass extinctions and these rapid change in climate, uh, do you have an idea as to what caused it? Uh, yeah, and it's it's different in every case, and and sometimes. Uh, for example, about 55 million years ago, uh, we get an episode where Earth's temperature warmed rather rapidly. Um, 
And by rather rapidly, I mean in a few thousand years, it, it, uh, the temperature went up substantially. Uh, the main reason, the best we can tell, is that uh, it probably started with volca volcanism or abnormal volcanism in the uh, oceans that uh, changed the carbon output. You've got a lot of carbon that's stored at the bottom of the ocean that in this case was released as this volcanism uh, raised the temperature locally and, and essentially bubbled off all this methane and carbon dioxide. So when you get this rapid increase in uh, greenhouse gases, the temperature went up, uh, it spiked, the ocean acidity spiked, uh, climate zones changed, the nutrient cycles changed, and the, the food system essentially broke down and for a period. Uh, so this spiked until the main forcing, as we call it, was gone, and Earth's climate recovered after, you know, a couple hundred thousand years. <laughs> so well, it was a, it was a, a long question. recovery. Here's a but, question, though. Um, when, when, you, when you say Earth recovered, okay, so you, say you, you get these rapid uh, release of uh, ga uh, uh, greenhouse gases, like methane, I'm assuming, right, and a lot of carbon mm -hmm. dioxide and stuff like that. How do these gases get captured, you know, when the Earth cools after a while? Or how, what's the process for that? Uh, the main exchange is, is between the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, so, car well, carbon dioxide and, and methane and other gases are constantly exchanged between the ocean and atmosphere. Uh, we do have, in, in parts where the ocean is, is cold enough, uh, it is possible to freeze, more or less, like freeze methane into a, a solid form with a bonding with a water and a few other things, uh, what's called a methane clathrate. And this, this forms at the bottom of the ocean. I mean, there are such in, in sediments at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean today, so if there were, you know, a volcano at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, that could happen again. Um, uh, other, the other main way that carbon is buried is through the biological cycles. And uh, so carbon is taken up through photosynthesis, for example, in the surface ocean, uh, mainly in the surface ocean. Of course, we think about forests and, and big trees and things, and that, those do play a part. But by and large, most carbon is taken up by uh, plankton and algae in the surface ocean. Mm. Now, normally, all of that plankton and algae, after it dies, it floats around, it gets uh, oxidized and released back into the atmosphere, but a small portion does sink down and is stored in sediments at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so that's that's sort of the buffer. You know, when we get a lot of excess carbon in the atmosphere, it tends to get stored after a long time uh, because it increases the rate at which carbon is uh, taken down by the oceans and stored in the bottom of the ocean. So as you're doing this research and you, you build up a, a certain degree of predictability about what you're going to find, have you found anything that's been unexpected you know, during, during the time that, that you've, been, uh, you've been doing your work? That's unexpected? Um, yes. <laughs> well, sure. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Just you know, go ahead. You know, with whatever, whatever you found, that'd be interesting too. Well, I, yeah, I'd have to go in a few details about um, what I most recently researched, is, if that's okay. Sure, oh, always. Um, yeah. I mean, so my my recent interest is is looking at the last twelve thousand years of of climate history. I mean, I give you a couple examples of. I, I know I've talked a lot about greenhouse gases. Other those other mass extinctions. We do have cases like where the uh, we have a meteor impact that initiates things, um, but that's, you know, a period of very abrupt climate change before and after. Um, that was the extinction of the dinosaurs, obviously. Yeah. At the end of the Cretaceous. Yeah, along with uh, most marine organisms at that time, that was the big extinction was in the oceans, um, not, not as much on land. Uh, it, it's, you know, so there are many different uh, factors that can, that can suddenly change the climate, but we're just worried generally when that happens, uh, that's when Earth's, ecosystem, its biology really suffers and, and takes a long time to recover. Uh, so I'm looking just at the last 12,000 years in my recent research. Um, we do have a generally good portrait of what's happened, you know, over the last several ice age cycles. Uh, the longest ice core record goes back about 800,000 years, and that, that shows us how Earth's climate has shifted about eight times between a glacial period and an interglacial period, as we call it. Um, you get a long-lived ice age for about 80, 90,000 years, and then some 10, 20, 30,000 years of warm period. And we're in one of those warm periods right now. So we've recovered out of the last ice age, which peaked about 21,000 years ago. Um, and of course, there's a, a transition as, it, as Earth's climate warms from 21,000 years ago until today. 
Um, the general idea, though, from geologic records is that uh, Earth's climate warmed and warmed and warmed until about 8,000 years ago when it peaked. About 8,000 years ago, the temperature was pretty comparable to what it was at the end of last century. Uh, so it's, that, that is to say that from 8,000 years ago until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, we thought that the surface temperature very gradually and slightly cooled off by about one degree Celsius over the 8,000 year period. And then in the last century, uh, with the human impact, we've seen a very rapid rise uh, in temperatures. That's, that's the uh, hockey stick, as it's called. Um, the hockey stick model that man studied went back about 1,000 years, uh, but extend, we can extend that back even further. Uh, and we, that, that's the general idea is that global temperatures peaked about 8,000 years ago and cooled off until today. So that created some something of a controversy. Um, I mean, by controversy, it, it, there was a, a little bit of a contradiction between approaches here. Because when we look at geologic records, that's the uh, idea that we have. Uh, but when we look at climate models, we get a different portrait. Um, climate models we use, of course, to project how climate will change in the future. But the way you test climate models, I mean, you can't go into the future and see if they got it right. So what you do is tell them to reconstruct the past. You know, say, here's, here's what Earth's orbit looked like. Here's the amount of uh, ice that was on Earth. You know, here's what the vegetation looked like, et cetera, et cetera. You put all those uh, parameters in, and, and the climate model will reconstruct what it says should have happened over the last 21,000 years. Uh, so there were a number of experiments in the last decade, uh, the Trace 21 project, that tried to reconstruct 21,000 years of climate using computer models. Uh, and they all came to very similar conclusions, that coming out of the Ice Age, you get continual warming. You know, it uh, kind of goes up and down a few times, but uh, continual warming until pretty much the moderns, the last century, you get a big spike in temperatures, as we observe. Uh, that's different from what the geologic records show. In, in the models, we don't see a peak in temperatures 8,000 years ago. Instead, it's still relatively cold and warming up. And that's because in the models, the main drivers of climate change were the uh, disappearance of the ice sheets, the rise in greenhouse gases. And, and, and Sorry, those are the main drivers. And, and as uh, ice sheets continued to disappear, that drove a lot of warming until they were gone. And then there was a slight rise in greenhouse gases after that that would have caused the rest of the warming. So we went to, I, I went to uh, Russia to try and fill in a data gap that we had, this uh, geologic compilation. Um, you know, it covered most of the Earth, but pretty much all of Russia was not represented uh, at all. We, we didn't have any good records there of detailed climate change over the last 12,000 years. So I thought, well, I'll try and go and fill in a data gap uh, to throw in with this compilation. So we found, um, we found a cave, or a couple of caves, actually, that were very suitable. We collected our samples, and, and we did our isotopic analysis, and what we found was that uh, the temperature change over the last 12,000 years in this part of Russia didn't look like that global compilation of geologic records. In fact, really? it almost perfectly matched the climate models. And so, you know, a couple, well, before this and a few years ago, uh, there was a big question, well, why don't the geologic data match the climate model reconstructions. I mean, they should, so that means there's a problem either with the geologic data or with the climate models. And if there's a problem with the climate models, maybe they're not projecting accurately what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so what we found is that um, the climate models were far more accurate than we would have suspected. And the main reason is that uh, the geologic records that we had to date mainly showed us only what happened during summer and in certain parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we found that... Uh, that uh, other parts of the world and during winter you get very different temperature tra trajectories over the last 12,000 years. Uh, that wasn't something that we expected to find, but it turned out very positively because it supported the climate models, their accuracy, and it helped us, it, or it will help us adjust the geologic records of um, past climate change. No, Sorry, that's a long explanation, but that was a, that's mainly what we found and Something that was unexpected. <laughs> no, of course. Of no, course. it couldn't. It filled in a gap. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, do you, th this is funny because you talk about the, the climate models, and there's a lot of pushback out there in the general public against these climate models. And do you feel that these people are simply not understanding the concept of time here? I mean, you're talking, for example, you talked about 8,000 years, a, rapidly dro a rapid drop of one degree. Mm -hmm. And now I think this is what people are having a hard time putting their, their, their heads around now. 
one degree at 8,000 years for a scientist like yourself is rapid, but for people, the average Joe is just, well, what are you talking about? Yeah, it is. Um, it, it's important to put things in perspective, and that's something that's easy to do. So you can't blame the general public for not taking the time to put this all in perspective. Uh, when we come up with figures like, you know, 0 0.8 degrees Celsius, the climate has warmed in the last 60 years or something like that. Uh, we, you know, you throw out figures like that and it just sounds so minuscule and there's not noticeable change, you know, from one year to the next or one decade to the next. And so we think in terms of human lifetimes and it's just not relevant, but it's also not accurate for assessing um, the real impacts of climate change or the scale of it. So to give you a better sense from the peak of the last ice age, that's 21,000 years ago until the beginning of the industrial revolution. So that's about the 1850s. Between that time, that 21,000 year period, uh, earth surface warmed by about four degrees Celsius, right? So four degrees Celsius in 21,000 years. Whereas since the industrial revolution, we've seen at least one degree Celsius of warming, Ooh. right? So, so compare that that's scale, heavy. you know, four degrees over mm -hmm. 21,000 years versus one degree over 150 years or less. Wow. I mean, that, that's when you put it change. on that scale, you can see just how much more rapid and abrupt modern climate change is. So you see these um, pushbacks from, from people, you, you know, you try and, if you try to tell the general public, like, look, this is important, you should, uh, you should learn about this, you should worry about the impacts, they'll say, well, come on, the climate is always changing, you know, we, we know that Earth goes through ice ages and warm periods and it had greenhouse periods, for example, in the Cambrian and, and when the dinosaurs were around, uh, you know, Earth's temperature was higher. It's not a big deal. It's nothing to worry about. I said, well, look at the scale. When you look at the, the rate of change, uh, it, it is a huge deal. It's very anomalous what's happening now. It looks nothing like the past. Uh, and by the past, I mean, the, you know, the last 10,000 years, the last 100,000 years or, or a million years for that matter. Uh, we don't see anything like this where where Earth's atmosphere has spiked in its greenhouse gas concentrations the way it does today, uh, where temperatures change as rapidly it does as it does today. Even coming out of the Ice Age, it didn't change this rapidly. So, I mean, it's it's really difficult to communicate that point because you're looking at such small numbers and think, well, what's a what a big deal? You know, one degree Celsius. That's you know, I'm I'm thinking in terms of Fahrenheit. So that's like the difference between a 70 degree day and and what, a 72 degree day? I mean, I don't yeah. notice a difference, and I'd rather it be 72 instead of 70 degrees. And that's the wrong way to think about it. Well, come on, um, Jonathan. You're, 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 you're trying to scare people here. We all know this is all done by the sun, right? The sun goes in the cycle, and that's what's causing it, no? Yeah, yeah. The sun does have its cycles, too. So I mean, that's, that's probably more studied than, than study, the scientists who study the, uh, the atmospheric impact. In fact, uh, you see people all the time say, well, why don't we just study the sun's impact? We need more research on that. I mean, you can go to these meetings like at AGU in San Francisco with 25,000 presentations, uh, and you can see just how many rows of posters, how many rooms filled with presentations are devoted to the topic of how the sun impacts the climate. It's something that we have very well constrained, uh, that we understand, and that's how we know that modern warming has nothing to do with the solar cycle. In fact, uh, we've seen solar intensity decrease over the last 40 to 50 years, uh, not by a lot, but decrease. So you would expect a cooling in surface temperature since the 1970s, whereas we see the exact opposite. So that's how we know it has nothing to do with the sun. Uh, we also know that with um, we, we have good measurements, I say relatively good measurements, at least going back eight or 9,000 years of solar intensity. And we know that uh, the solar output changes only by, you know, maybe a tenth of a percent either way. It goes up and down. But it's it's a very, very minor change, and it has very little impact on surface temperatures. And we see the, the worst of the impact was, uh, you go back a few hundred years ago to what was called the Little Ice Age. It really wasn't much of an ice age. I mean, it was relatively cold in, in parts of Europe and the North Atlantic area. Uh, but for much of the rest of the world, it, it wasn't that much different. You know, so the solar impact is very minuscule. Um, but we study all these things. Like I said, we, go, we look at all the natural factors uh, that, that affected Earth's climate before humans were ever here. And then we compare that to uh, some of the human, the anthropogenic factors. And, and that's how we can narrow down just how uh, significant the anthropogenic impact is and just how worrisome it is for the future. Because we've seen what happens when this 
you know, when Earth's climate changes this fast. I mean, the, the, it's not so much, um, you know, uh, sorry, Earth's, Earth's life, its, uh, its ecosystems, including humans, can adapt to just about any climate. Um, but it takes a long, long time. So it, it's not, you know, whether it's warm or cold that we're really worried about. It's the, the rate of change mm-hmm. and the magnitude of change in, in that small uh, time span that, that's worrisome. That's what starts to cause, you know, extinctions. That's what, you know, when the climate changes faster than, than animals can evolve, when it changes faster than societies can adapt, um, that's when it costs uh, immense amounts. Okay. So, so when, when, you, when you talk about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, they always come up with a figure of how many parts per million. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a while that they were saying you, we shouldn't pass 350. I think we just passed the 410. Uh, mm-hmm. how, how, I mean, what, what's, for lack of a better term here, what's the tipping point in your, in your, uh, in your mind where it might just run off and we can't do anything about it at this point? That's a, that's a difficult question to answer. I'm probably not the best to ask. Um, we do know that it's never very likely not been above 300 or 350 parts per million in the last million years. All right. Ouch. So we are entering uncharted territory, at least for Earth's modern climates. Uh, we know that in the past, it's been very high. If you go back 500 million years ago, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere was as high as two, three, four thousand 4,000 parts per million. But of course, the sun was uh, weaker. You know, The sun is getting stronger with time. That's over a very long time scale. So 500 million years ago, the sun was weaker, and that balanced out the higher greenhouse gas content. That meant that, yes, Earth's climate was warmer, but not by all that much. Uh, the tipping point, the more worrisome, is not a real number uh, on carbon dioxide. Uh, it's it's more with um, the feedbacks, for example, in, in the Earth's cryosphere, the cryosphere which would include all ice on sea and land. Um, I mean, that's where uh, our current climate is, is somewhat buffered uh, because when it's Sorry, uh, ice on land, for example, reflects sunlight back to space, and so that prevents it from warming things up too fast. But when you start to melt that ice, if you melt enough of it, then glaciers can't grow back at all, and sea ice doesn't reform at all when it should. Once you get to that point, you get a lot of stored heat in Earth's system that gets now released into the atmosphere and exacerbates whatever changes you have otherwise. So uh, it's, that, that is to say that if we could hold it right now at 400 parts per million, if, uh, if Earth's whole system adapted eventually to 400 parts per million, I mean, the last time uh, Earth's atmosphere had 400 parts per million CO2 in it uh, was a very, I mean, it was a very long time ago. We didn't have these full um, ice age swings like we do in the modern climate. Um, it was, yeah, quite a bit more tempered ac- across the globe. Um, and in some parts of the world, it's, it, you know, it's very different. It was a lot more deserty. It was, uh, you know, you get a lot more extreme rains and things like that. Uh, these are the sort of things we don't want to happen in, in certain parts of the world where large uh, parts of the human popu- uh, par- sorry, where large portions of the human population are currently. Mm-hmm. You know, for example, in, in that band of, say, North Africa, the Mideast, and Southern Asia. And that's, that's a massive portion of the human population currently. But these are the zones that are strongly affected if you uh, hold CO2 at 400 parts per million and let the rest of the system adapt. Because those are the zones that get uh, that become a lot drier, for example, uh, with much less reliable uh, storms from one season to the next when you get a higher risk of heat waves and things like that. Uh, that's something that wouldn't have mattered so much, you know, two million years ago. When, uh, when human population was small, when animals could just move around and adapt to this desert environment. But uh, now you can't. You've got big cities yeah. and, and country borders, and you can't just move away from one country into that. I mean, you see what's happening now when you get mass migrations from one small country into the rest of the world. You know, there's a huge, uh, a huge response, uh, you know, a lot of it negative from other countries that say, you know, we don't want you here. Oh come, uh, on, but, come on, Jonathan! You, you, there's no problem with a big city in the desert. You live in Vegas, after all, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I, I see exactly the problems here. Um, we're we're not in a good place right now. Uh, we've got enough water now to sustain the city, but uh, our main water resources are uh, diminishing. And and right now we I mean, we've got Lake Mead, this giant uh, dammed reservoir just outside of Vegas that uh, drives a drives the Hoover Dam, so that's a big source of electricity. And it's also a major source of water. 
uh, for us locally here. But uh, this is something that the, the lake levels in, in Lake Mead have been dropping for some 10, 15, 20 years now. And they're probably not going to recover. <laughs> so with all of the work that, that you're, you're doing, how frustrating is it for you and your colleagues to deal with the climate deniers and the, the negative political uh, situation? That. We should also ask him about the Paris Accord, how he feels about that. Well, right? yeah, I was He's, kind of getting... Okay, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 go ahead. No, That's no, you, no, no. Sure. we're a team here. <laughs> <laughs> What are your thoughts on all of this? That's right. <laughs> Just yeah, let that's... loose, Jonathan. <laughs> we're we're ready for anything here. Sure. Well, yeah. There's there's a lot to visit there. I'll say, <clears throat> generally, it it is quite frustrating. Um, this is something that's it's not out of the ordinary. I mean, if you if you are a geologist who studied the age of the Earth, and um, <clears throat> that you know for a time, and and even today gets a lot of pushback. Not as much. Uh, except in certain circles, but uh, you know, people start to treat you like you're uh, you're an evil person for coming to the conclusions you do about how old the Earth is, and and I've had that in in certain circles. Well, that's right, um, because we all know the Earth is only six thousand years old. What? Right. If you uh, if you you know if you study uh, biology and, and medicine, and you get a lot of pushbacks as well from people who are. Uh, who need the biology and the medicine? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, you, you know you. You, you see that, for example, in certain movements, they'll say, well, we don't want to we don't want to adapt or implement this sort of food technology. It's just not natural. Uh, you know, we don't want to administer these vaccines. It's not natural. It's harmful, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you, you know, you see many fields in science where there's a big pushback by the general population or certain um, smaller demographics. Uh, but it may be quite loud and vocal and well funded. And in which case it can be very frustrating that. Um, that uh, people sitting back on their armchairs will will dismiss everything you say, and they're essentially taught and trained to be skeptical of every word that you that comes out of your mouth. So that that's extremely frustrating. Um, I think that I mean the most frustrating part is, you know, if people aren't interested, if they want to be dismissive of whatever conclusions I come to in my research or whatever I try to teach in the classroom, uh, that's fine. That's that's really their loss, <laughs> you could say, but. Um, it's it's more frustrating when you hear the sort of accusations that come up like, well, we're just we're doing this for the money so we can get grant money. Right. So we can keep our jobs. <laughs> That's the only reason that uh, so many scientists are on board with this global warming thing. Uh, and it's it's just so beyond absurd. Um, you know, I'll tell you now, I've, I mean, I have quite a few with the degree that I have now. The the main job that I would be geared toward is uh, oil exploration, oil exploration. And I have. You know, a number of classmates who have finished their degrees and gone off to do that job. And I'll tell you, their their annual, sorry, their average starting salary was over $100,000 mm. a year, right? Um, I'll be lucky if I go on studying climate change and stay in academia, I'll be lucky to start at sixty or 70000 a year. Well, brush so up already, on your French because they'll welcome you in France. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to that, actually. <laughs> but, um, you know, you take a huge pay cut by studying this topic for one uh it's your you know you're receiving grant funding is not dependent on what conclusions you come to you know even if we determined that in fact the humans were not largely responsible for modern climate change or that it, you know that the earth was going back into a cooling trend i mean if that were a conclusion it, it wouldn't uh get rid of the need for, you know, studying Earth's climate system. It's still something important that we should know about and need to understand. I, you know, I just find it so disturbing that, that people would think this way. They, you know, without having any knowledge of what it's like to get a, a scientific grant, what it actually pays for, uh, you know, the fact that that grant money doesn't go into your pocket, it goes into uh, research. You know, it goes to paying, say, the stipend for a, a new master student who's just trying to get a thousand dollars a month so he, he can uh, afford an apartment, or that you know she can uh, afford her own car. You know, there's no big money in this. Besides that, it's you know I find it most frustrating that uh, people tend to look at this working backwards. And here's here's what I mean. This the topic of climate change, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's not just something that affects our pure scientific curiosity. Uh, there are real there are really three questions here. One is purely a scientific question. Uh, is 
the climate warming today? And if so, what kind of impact do humans have? Like, that's a scientific question. That's something that everyone should be able to answer the same way uh, applying this, co- this common scientific method, correct? Uh, the second question is, well, if that's the case, if humans are responsible, then ought we do anything about it? That's a moral question, right? You could come to the conclusion, well, yeah, the, the globe is warming, we're all screwed, and who cares? I don't care. I don't have any responsibility or obligation to change it because, you know, morally, I don't think it's my problem. I mean, you could come to that conclusion, but this is a totally different question. It's a moral question, right? And and once you answer that moral question, let's say that, that we decide, yes, we are obligated as humans to do something about this, knowing what the impacts are, then the question is, how can we do something about it? What can we do? That's a political question, right? And that's where people really get hung up, hmm. uh, is the how can we address this? Uh, because right now you've got um, two part, you know, two major parties in the U.S. at least, and only one of them has uh, been really uh, active on, on trying to implement um, solutions. Or, or implement real solutions. The other one is kind of banked on the fact that half of Americans just don't believe there's a problem here to address. Jonathan, sounds um, like the basis of a paper you need to write. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm serious. So, so, so what happens, so, you know, you get, what that means is, in the U.S. at least, a majority of solutions offered to address climate change, to mitigate climate change, have to do, uh, or they involve some uh, federal-scale funding project, investment in infrastructure, and, you know, tax subsidies and things like that. And people hear these words and, and they say, well, I don't trust the government. I don't want it to be bigger. I don't want, pay, I don't want to pay taxes to this, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fine. If, you know, if that's your political view, then okay, find a way to address this that doesn't involve, you know, international agreements and, and sorry, globalist agendas and, and high taxes and whatever it else whatever else it is you don't like. Um, But people start with that political question. They say, I don't like uh, the government coming into our lives and industries and telling them how to function so that we can fix some problem. Therefore, I'm going to be skeptical that there is a problem in the first place. And and believe it or not, that's where most skepticism starts. We know this because um, people who acknowledge uh, global warming and, and generally accept the scientific consensus on this uh, they come from all different political and religious backgrounds, for that matter. Uh, people who are skeptical are very heavily weighted toward those who lean libertarian, uh, conservative, and, uh, yeah, well, sorry, libertarian, conservative, and, and, you know, political ideology. They have a very specific political ideology. That's what's really driving um, the public skepticism. Because they, these groups go out and they have well-funded PR campaigns that teach the public that there is some sort of scientific controversy and it's okay to be skeptical. Yeah, they should, so do. That, they should do. Perfect. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm just making sure I finish my thought. So that's, that's, what's, um, that's what's really frustrating because people start with the politics and uh, they end with their d- being dismissive of whatever you say from, as a scientist. That, as opposed to listening to you first and, and reasoning with you, uh, as a scientist, and then moving on to the political question. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for all your time there. Maybe one last little thing before we let you go uh, is uh, what would you recommend the average Joe that might want to l- do a bit more research? What, what sources would you recommend they, they look for? Yeah, the, uh, so uh, probably one of the best resources is uh, Skeptical Science. Skeptical and Skeptical Science. Science is, I mean, it's a collaboration, a collaborative project of, of climate scientists and uh, not even just physical scientists, but but others who've come together uh, to look at this topic and, and devote a lot of their time, a lot of uh, articles and so forth, to addressing the common questions. So go to skepticalscience.com, and, and you can see on the left bar what they've got are the most used climate myths. The first one, you know, that climate's changed before, you know, that it's just the sun, that it's not a big deal, that there's no consensus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you can you can look on these look at these uh, articles and every article that they write they um, they have a basic an intermediate and or an advanced version of the same article so that you know depending on your understanding of the background science uh, you can you can take your pick and and see what what actual climate scientists have to say about these topics that's much better than just going to Google and finding the first thing that pops up because the first thing that pops up is likely to be um, <clears throat> essentially I, funded pseudoscience. Mm, you know, it's, it's, it's like if you go to Google and you ask, you know, how old is the earth? 
then you're going to get an even mix of, of uh, uh, answers from actual uh, geologists and um, resources like Answers in Genesis who will uh, try to get you everything they can to uh, make you skeptical of, of what those evil geologists say, right? <laughs> those so, evil geologists. <laughs> yeah, including, including me. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, so I, I look at this resource first. Um, skeptical Science is great. I think it's a... Uh, realclimate.org. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Uh, Excellent. Uh, that one's a little bit more, uh, it's, it's higher on the technical level, but the, but these are great. To, to get the actual feedback in, um, you know, lay articles from, from real climate scientists who can at least address what uh, what those who are skeptical and dismissive of, of the climate science. Uh, Perfect. At, at least look at the problems in there. Excellent. And Jonathan, if people want to find out more about you, where can they reach you? Uh, <clears throat> oh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> the one question you couldn't answer. <laughs> no, if you, okay, so if you'd like to, you know, talk to me about uh, climate, if you'd like to talk to me or, you know, a couple others, uh, I would look at, uh, and if you use Facebook a lot, go to uh, Catherine Hayhoe's page. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is a climate scientist at Texas Tech University. Uh, she is specifically um, trying to communicate climate science to, uh, sorry, communicate climate science to uh, those Americans who fall on a more conservative side, um, say a, a religious side, evangelical side, uh, so she does occasionally bring up the uh, you know that intersection how how uh, religion and climate science actually go together. Um, but but she's a, an excellent scientist. You can ask your questions there. She does uh, live streams uh, where you can ask your question live, or you can ask it in Facebook. Um, I'm an admin on that page, and I'll be happy to try and address your question as well. What's the last uh, name? Uh, Catherine what? Hayho, H-A-Y-H-O-E. Uh, H-A-Y-H-O-E. So you can find her on uh, her Facebook page, follow that, or her personal page. Uh, I mean, she's a great resource. You could look at uh, lectures she's given and, and such on, I mean, you could find those online or at her site. Most recently, I mean, she was she was part of the White House conversation uh, with uh, Barack Obama and Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio. That was with uh, DiCaprio's uh, new movie, uh, Before the Flood that came out, his, his movie regarding climate change. So, yeah, th- these are good starting points. It gives you a chance to talk to people who uh, study this for a living. Uh, I would not rely on the random Internet resources. Uh, they, yeah, that's, that's a bad place to go because you gotta, you got to remember there are a lot of people who uh, legitimately think that uh, there's, you know, they're, they're legitimately skeptical. They don't buy what most climate scientists are saying, and that's fine. You can... You know, we're, we're open to scientific debate, but there are a lot of people, too, whose job it is, I mean, who are very well paid just to confuse you on this topic and mislead the public on this topic, because that has uh, very, you know, it's very advantage and advantageous for them politically uh, mm-hmm. that, that the public doesn't know what's happening in, in this part of academia. Fantastic, Jonathan. Thank you so much for all your time. But before well, I let you go... One little thing I gotta ask you to say. Can I can I get you to say hi? I'm Jonathan Baker, and I took a left at the valley. <laughs> hi, I'm Jonathan Baker. I took a left at the valley. And that was Jonathan Baker. What an interesting guy. This guy could just go on and on and on yeah. like climate. <laughs> and you know what? He's he's not. I'm. I could have kept on going forever on this. Yeah, me too. And I didn't. I didn't expect it. I really. I really didn't because it. I think it depends on the presenter, it does. doesn't it? It, it could does. either be dry and factual, or it could be brimming over with the kind of uh, uh, passion that that he brings to the topic. So it was good. There's a few things that really stood out in my mind there. When he says, for example, twenty one thousand years, and there's a four degree chance. Yeah. And then since the industrial revolution. You know, there's a one degree. Uh, what, what's that? Two hundred years? Huge. That's change huge. Over, over that is a couple hundred yes, years. Yes, and that really puts into perspective. You know, because people say one degree. Who cares? Well, because people but, think about weather, not exactly. global climate. Exactly. In global climate, they're averaging the temperatures across the entire planet. If four degrees can make the difference between an ice age and 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 uh, and, and well, not, then one degree. The, you is, just do the. Do the um, yeah. Uh, I mean, if anybody can look at it in that scale, do the rough math. One degree over the entire surface of the planet. We're talking ocean temperatures, yes. land temperatures. He also, what he, does that mean for localized weather patterns? Because there's some areas that saw no temperature change. There's some areas that saw extreme temperature yes. changes in their weather, which creates extreme weather patterns. 
And there's where you see these weird storms and yeah. these, uh, you know. This is what people don't realize. Yeah, and they you don't know? realize. That one degree change is huge. Heat is energy. So you're adding more energy into all these weather systems. So all of a sudden your tornadoes are bigger, your your your, yep. your, your typhoons are stronger, your hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera, your snowstorms, whatever. And yeah. and the wealth of knowledge that these guys have, oh, have yeah. uh, amassed over the last couple of hundred years of studying this, people don't understand it. They don't they don't see it. They don't see what these guys see and know. And and it's all there for us. If anybody cares to study it, they've published all of this stuff. It, it's there for us to look at. It is, know? and and that makes it even worse when uh, um, both in Canada with the conservatives and the U.S. with the conservatives, where they begin to destroy the data on on various websites mm-hmm. where people have worked Should so never, hard. Ever destroy and data. when when Trump mm-hmm. came in. Um, there were several articles about the scientists madly scrambling to get all of that saved. So it, yeah, it they actually saved it different. offshore. They moved it to different repositories. Yeah. 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 So I mean, to, to do all of that work and then to have people who are religiously and politically motivated destroy it. You know, for no other reason than to make a buck? they think it's a Chinese hoax, and oh. they don't they don't want it to affect the oil and, and gas. And let's not go there. Industry. We'll be doing a podcast for the next no, three no. hours at this point. Well, but we, we can always bring Jonathan back to oh, do that. And we will, <laughs> and we absolutely will. You yeah. go, Nancy. You go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys, for joining us today on the show. And uh, you can always follow us at lettervalley dot com um, on Facebook or on Twitter at LETV Podcast. Send us an email at lettervalley at outlook dot com. If you'd be so kind, go on uh, iTunes, give us a five star review. That really helps others find the show. If you're not going to give us a five star review, you're going to give us a one star review, and then don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, we have Jerry Dewitt, the best hair in atheism. Oh boy, good. That's going to be fun. We'll be talking to Jerry Dewitt. Also, uh, and uh, we'll be doing this soon a uh, best of uh, this day in history. Oh. A little clip show. Yeah. We have Dan Barker of the Freedom from uh, Religion Foundation. He's going to be talking to us soon as well. And you heard it here first. Eli Bosnick returns. And he doesn't return by himself. He returns with Tom and Cecil of Cognitive Dissonance. They agreed to come on the show. That will be fantastic. Very cool. Very, very cool. Anything else we can add? Just, no, we, we, just, we do a lot no, of work for we, people out we there. We did great. We did awesome. You know, we're, we're we, just we have awesome. like three listeners out there and we do all this work for them. So I sure <laughs> hope you guys appreciate that. <laughs> we should turn the show over to them and we could become the audience. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good thing we're doing that we're not doing this to <laughs> get rich. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, guys. Until next time. isn't real, but Jesus is, or Zeus, Thor, or Mithra, Vishnu, you don't believe in them, I think the reason is apparent, you do what you're told, and believe in the God assigned by your parents, I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen, I call it how I see it, I say it's ignorance, and you just call it faith, and unsubstantiated claims, that's something to be ashamed, I'm an atheist, Take a sec, don't mean to sound so hateful But I swear to God, pun intended I find it disgraceful That thousands of children are raped by priests And since they're holy men of God They get away scot-free And the Pope does his very best To keep it on the hush Don't wanna affect business He loves money too much We know that they love the kids But how the fuck can we protect them While they plan to molest them We teaching them to respect them Respect them Fuck that. The system is broke down, working backwards, and the only action of tactic I plan to practice now is to attack them. The parties of God's hands are bloodstained, millions of murders by believers, and they're all in God's name. And let me take a sec, don't mean to sound so hateful, but I swear to God, pun intended, I find it disgraceful. That many atheists are told to be quiet, you're not alone, speak your mind, time to let it be known.
Uh. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance, and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. 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 I'm an atheist.